ideas. I just have to say I'm struck by at least one aspect of the audience. I speak a lot at holistic psychology and energy healing type of conferences, and the participants are usually therapists and energy workers, and 80, 90 percent are women. And they talk about how they really get the stuff, and then they go, go home to their engineering boyfriends and husbands and tussle it out. It looks like all the boyfriends who are engineers and academics came tonight, so <laughs> thank, you for, thank you for coming. And your girlfriends and wives are wonderful, by the way. <laughs> so um, I'm a psychiatrist. I worked at Spalding Rehab Hospital in the pain management program for about 30 years. I have a long-standing interest in energy medicine and some of the healing modalities, um, which I learned about kind of before my brainwashing process was complete. So I've been traveling both tracks. And chronic pain allows you the opportunity, because patients are miserable, they're willing to try anything. So we've used a lot of these energy modalities over the years. And one situation in particular really caught my attention because it was very hard to explain by uh, the standard medical model. It's phantom limb pain. So I'm going to be talking about that clinically and energetically. Um, in some ways, the best way to start is actually with a brief five-minute video clip. So let me just... Um... Let's meet the aptly named John Pickup, who after losing an arm, started a company which provides amputee stunt people for films. I had a motorbike accident 20 years ago, my fault, basically, <laughs> and I had the dead arm amputated. One area I'm still really interested in is phantom limb pain, which I know you do some for. Yeah. Talk us through how that works. It's all sorts of different pains, different levels of pain. Sometimes it feels like you've just got your fingers, like a pins and needle type yeah. feeling. And then there are other times when you've got like, this incredible sharp pain. So you can actually feel the fingers and all sorts. You can actually still feel the hands, still feel the fingers. It feels like they're moving. I want to try something with you which I hope will be entirely comfortable, although it's sort of, it's related to that. What I'd like to do, if you have me do, is just to draw around your prosthetic hand there. So if you can just turn it so it's palm up for me. I'm going to draw around your arm and hand like this. If you could uh, take the arm off for me. So what I'm going to ask you to do is take part in a kind of imaginary game. The first thing I'd like you to do is to imagine that your arm occupies that space. Just to help you do this, if you just close your eyes for me. And in this imaginary game, that right arm on the table is absolutely as sensitive and vibrant and alive as it ever was. And in the imaginary game, I'm going to touch on one of the fingers. Obviously, it would be physiologically impossible for you to feel which one of those fingers I'm touching because there is literally nothing there at all. But instead of you thinking, well, I don't know, I want you to think, well, if I did know, which finger would I feel in touching? What I'm going to ask you to do, just so that everybody knows that you really aren't going to be able to see them, Again, I want you to keep your eyes closed. I'm just going to ask you to look off to, to your left. From just turn your head to your left. That's great. I'm just going to touch on one of the fingers. Now. It's with your eyes closed. I promise you I won't move the finger. I'm going to keep it right where it is. Just take a moment. And just imagine a sensation. A sensation being carried from the touch receptors in the dermis of the skin there. That message being carried along along your spinal column and into your brain where it's interpreted as a sensation of one of those fingers being touched. An imaginary sensation. I want you to tell me which finger I'm touching. Is it the ring finger? Open your eyes and have a look. I won't move a muscle. It's the ring finger. Okay, we're going to try again. Okay. What are the eyes of it being right on? So if you do the same thing for me, close your eyes and just look off to the side. Now I've got a box of objects here on the table. I'm going to place an object onto the palm of that hand. Please keep your eyes closed. And I'm going to place it in the center of my hand, like that. Please don't peek. And I want you to get any beginnings of the sensation there. Weight or temperature or surface material, anything you like. Just let me know what you get. First thing you sense for. Is it smooth? Something smooth, okay. What about shape? Okay, now I know when you shake your head, that's going to be you thinking, no, I can't do it. So think more in terms of, yes, I can do it. So it does become that imaginary game, almost like a role-playing game. Play the role of somebody who can feel something in their head. So you said it's smooth. 
Is it quite thin, quite long? Okay. It feels kind of like a plasticky kind of... This is very interesting what you're saying. Um, I kind of want you to have a look. I want you to see if you can get any closer to identifying it. Maybe something like a shoe horn or something. Mm. Have a look. It's not bad. It's not a shoe horn, but... Uh, do you want to do it again? Let's do it again. Okay, no, let's just try it. Um, let's, let's do this one last time. Close your eyes for me. Change it to something else. Cooler, mm. harder, more solid surface. Shape. Just concentrate on the sensations from the hand. Feels something like a cup. Like a cup of some sort. Yeah. Really? Okay. Um, Teacup. <laughs> uh, okay, you can look like. Um, <laughs> it's not smelling teacup. <laughs> it felt the, the kind of smoothness, the coldness that you get from ceramic when you first touch it. I actually managed to put the finger inside the cup. So I actually knew that it, it was hollow inside. So I was like, oh, it's very hard to kind of pick out the different types of sensations you're getting from weight, cold, smoothness, whatever. But you can kind of discern what it is. And it's quite scary, <laughs> to be honest. I actually feel something in my hand that hasn't been there for nearly 20 years. It's very, very, very scary. Well, the limitations of the biomedical model, because that says that everything originates in the brain and the nervous system, and if there's nothing out there, that couldn't happen. So I gave this presentation, a very similar presentation, just uh, about a month ago at Harvard, at the medical school, where they have an institute to study research design for integrative medicine. And, you know, seemed like a good audience. I presented this uh, same slide, uh, slide, I mean, uh, video to them. And here were some of their potential explanations. And you can see what the, what the mentality is behind it. It's total, complete skepticism about the existence of any kind of energy. And, you know, these are possibilities that he might have peaked and they might have edited it out and, you might have been told ahead of time, and you know, all of these things could have happened that required an incredible amount of deception and ill will for that to happen. But you know, this is, this is where a lot of academic centers draw the line. And that's why, in, if it doesn't sound too warped, uh, phantom pain is my favorite pain disorder because it really shows the limitations of the medical model. So let me um, take you through a little bit of the history of it and uh, show you what we can learn from it. So this was the Bible in medical school, Gray's Anatomy. If you knew the, everything about the muscles and the bones and the cells and the tissues, you could explain everything. Um, and our understanding of pain actually goes back to Descartes here, 350 years ago. A peripheral noxious stimulus travels up to the brain where it's perceived as pain. But we've actually made vast strides in 350 years because now our models are in color. <laughs> It's actually the exact same thing, a peripheral noxious stimulus. You know, there's more subdivisions and we can break it down into nerve. The brain interprets it. Really? Uh, <laughs> it's not that different. So fortunately, there's been a revised edition of Gray's Anatomy. Uh, some of you may know the work of Alex Gray, uh, Sacred Mirrors, and just the whole notion that we're luminous beings and we have all these different interpenetrating layers of different kinds of energy. Interestingly enough, He's not related to Sir John Gray. That would have been a very amazing karmic reincarnational whatever, but uh, they're not connected. So this is, the, this is the model of anatomy, the full multidimensional model that we, we don't learn in medical school, but you guys here are researching what are some of the aspects of it that are more than just the nuts and the bolts. And, and the main point is that human beings are multidimensional. And this again is the limitation of the medical model is it focuses just on the physical body uh, even the idea of energy is, um, you know, we're learning to talk about it by using electromagnetism as the language rather than someone said earlier, not auras. You're not going to find 
uh, PubMed stuff on auras, but electromagnetic fields. And then, uh, you know, as a psychiatrist, the mind and thoughts and emotions were important. Again, it's, it's still fairly peripheral, social interconnections and social roles, the spiritual aspect of it, and the non-local dimensions. They're part of being human. It's just a question of what uh, paradigm you work with and whether you're looking at it like this or like this. And I think this is one of the um, best examples of the incompleteness of the biopsychosocial model. Just a, a couple of words about how pain is approached. In the allopathic or Western medical model, pain is the enemy. And in fact, most symptoms are treated as the enemy. And a good example of that, or, uh, illustration of that is how our medications are all anti-convulsants, anti-inflammatory, anti-neoplastic. We're always against everything. No really pro anything, unless you count Prozac, but that's not, <laughs> quite, <laughs> it's not really quite the same thing. So um, really, what in an integrative approach, you want to know about the person with the pain and the notion that pain is providing feedback, that it's actually a useful signal, not to be obliterated, but to be learned from. And what are ways of uh, rebalancing uh, the patient? So the program that I've worked in um, has been multidisciplinary. We have physical therapists, occupational therapists, a pain doctor to do some medication where appropriate, and a very strong behavioral component, which I'll talk a little bit about. But the main thing is that we teach people how to self-regulate their nervous system with biofeedback, um, some of the energy approach. It, is, is this not loud enough? Um, I'll try. I'll, it, can people hear in the back, or is it? Yeah, okay, so most people can hear, I'll, I'll try, but um, we'll see how it goes. So let me focus in a little bit about the history of phantom pain. This is, um, this is one of our typical patients at intake in the <laughs> clinic. Now this is um, from uh, a French military surgeon from five or 600 years ago. And um, you know we learn a lot from war, unfortunately, but his descriptions of amputation and sequelae are very, uh, accurate even, even nowadays, Ambroise Paré. In the uh, American Civil War, uh, Silas Mitchell was a, a similarly uh, a surgeon who did similar kind of documentation and uh, helped us to understand the syndrome better. Um, and it's been a part of, of, of our cultural history. Can you think of a famous uh, patient with phantom pain, phantom limb pain? Who would you say is the most famous? You're, I'm, I'm misleading you. The literary figure. Captain Ahab actually had phantom limb pain. And there are a couple of um, quotes from Moby Dick where um, he talks about it. And the first one, he's on the deck talking with the carpenter. And the carpenter said he's heard that a dismasted man, you know, using nautical terms, never loses the feeling, but it will still be pricking him at times. So the notion that there are unpleasant sensations even after the um, amputation has happened. So then Ahab proposes really an experiment that the, the um, carpenter takes his intact leg and places it where his, uh, takes away his stump so that the two of them combine to make one distinct leg to the eye, yet two to the soul because two people are having perceptions there. So where thou feelest tingling life, they are exactly there. There to a hair do I. It's a riddle. And really, that's the, the, the whole notion of how do we perceive things that are invisible. Just a, a more modern at, uh, treatment of the situation is a movie based on a true story of a bicyclist who was um, injured in an automobile accident and lost his leg and his life spiraled downward because he couldn't cycle anymore. Um, he was eventually healed of his phantom limb pain and there's a clue here in this picture about what the healing ingredient was if, you <laughs> if you're good at reading body language. So yeah, she, he meets a girl and she falls in love with him unconditionally despite what happened to him. And healing happens. And that's a very important phrase as I'll, I'll be talking about energy psychology in a bit and some of the trauma release therapies where that particular aspect of unconditional love is so crucial. So just a little bit about the, the, uh, the story of it. It happens most commonly after post-amputation but also even with spinal cord injury. And a majority of amputee patients will have a sensation that the limb is there. It's not always painful, but the numbers vary all over the place. Um, children have much lower percentages of the pain itself, and people who are born without limbs congenitally do not have phantom pain. And it can affect any organ, anything that's been uh, removed surgically, 
uh, and you can have phantoms of. And the pains are variable and extremely, extremely unpleasant. And unfortunately, medications and surgery and nerve ablations and things like that don't work very well. So here's a fairly recent quote that says, basically, most currently available treatments are ineffective. Um, this is sort of a, a pictorial uh, display of the different types of sensation. And you can see you wouldn't want any part of your body to feel that way. Um, and the, the treatments have been aimed at every level of the neuraxis of the spinal cord all the way up to the brain and yet still doesn't work. There's a lot of very interesting uh, uh, neurobiology that's been studied, especially with the, uh, the, the notion of neuroplasticity. The model is that the phantom sensations are basically hallucinations, tactile hallucinations constructed by the um, cortex as part of a reorganization when you're not receiving direct sensations from there, the brain will rewire to accommodate. And they'll have fMRIs, functional magnetic resonance imaging, to show differences in function after amputation. Um, but really, it's, um, it, you know, this whole idea of functional neuroanatomy is not, is not new to our tradition. <laughs> so you, you recognize that's been, that's been around for a long time where um, I'm actually blanking at the moment on what, uh, What's it called? Phrenology. Phrenology, thank you. Yeah, that they had the same idea that different emotions are located, different bumps in the head rather than, okay, enough taking out my aggression on the Western medical model. Um, so there are many integrator approaches to phantom pain, um, including the standard sort of bi um, mind-body approaches like biofeedback and hypnosis. Um, there's a, an, an innovative approach that involves the eye movements while thinking about upsetting events that somehow or other helps to release upsetting emotions. And that's been very helpful with uh, phantom pain. There's a mirror box therapy that is really fascinating. I don't have time to go into it, but it involves, the, for example, if one arm is missing, you set up a mirror opposite your intact arm so that it looks to you as though you have both arms and hands and fingers there. You move your int intact hands and it looks as though your missing hands are back and are working. And somehow or other, that um, is a very effective course of treatment. Um, I'll talk about the energetics of it later because this is proposed as part of the neuroplasticity model that your brain rewires and can learn new ways of interpreting sensation. This takes a while though. The rewiring process takes a while, yet you'll see some of these energy approaches are much too rapid to explain by that model. So going back to the model that I think is necessary in order to understand it, the energy field model. And it's part of our Western tradition. This is the Madonna. And you know, high spiritual beings are often portrayed with some kind of aura or nimbus, if you will. Um, this is, um, it could be an energy field diagram. It's, it's so, so exact. In the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, the same idea of uh, different, uh, layers to it, an overriding energy field or rainbow body as they call it. In Islam there's also the notion that people of high attainment also have um, corresponding uh, luminosity. Um, you can't read this, the, the doctor is saying to his patient, he's scolding his patient, he's saying, you've been fooling around with alternative medicines, haven't you? <laughs> And so there's a, there's a couple of points here. One is that your aura does expand with alternative medicine. And the other is that if a withered prune of a doctor like that can sense energy fields, then anybody can sense them. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, there are some very simple demonstrations. I don't know if you're familiar with some of these therapeutic touch type approaches. Um, again, we don't, we don't have time to do a demonstration here, but that type of sensing that something is between your hands forms the, the basis for what I'm going to describe to you. And uh, you know, now that we have uh, modern electronic equipment, people like the HeartMath folks and others are measuring that there is at least an electromagnetic type of field um, surrounding us. Whether that is the entirety of the energetics of the human field is, is not clear yet. A lot of this goes back to Franz Mesmer. You know, most people know him as a shout and a quack, but there's a very interesting backstory to him that he was very successful using his animal magnetism and his mesmeric passes in, to such an extent that he was threatening the conventional doctors of that time and they called a royal commission and they did a hatchet job on him. They did 
you know, some testing, but it was highly biased. And now, 200 years later, we're coming back to have another look at him. But the modern nursing practice of therapeutic touch is actually a analog, exact analog to his mesmeric passes. So without going into too much detail, I'll just say that I learned this technique and was using it in some of my patients. And basically, it involves feeling this sense that people often get of pressure or temperature or something. You assess first the, the field around the patient. So I was doing it with, uh, I decided to do it with one particular patient um, because the normal treatment program wasn't particularly helpful. He was a guy in his mid-30s, had been very athletic and had lost, um, I forget whether it was above or below the knee, in a crush injury at work. He worked on a loading dock. And after the surgical amputation, he was really hindered by the phantom pain and wasn't able to kind of get out of a rut and didn't respond well to, to most of the treatments that we did. Um, so kind of out of desperation on my part, a little bit of curiosity, but it was more along the lines of, what the hell? Um, I asked him, would you like to try this uh, new treatment called therapeutic uh, touch? And as I mentioned, they were willing to try anything. So he, he lay down on the table. He took off his prosthesis. I said, just close your eyes and relax. And I started <coughs> excuse me, by doing this assessment of his field. And I could feel the same pressure that we could feel in our hands I felt on his body. And for some reason, I continued down even where his leg was missing. And much to my surprise, I could feel that same pressure sensation you know, down at his foot level, even though there was no flesh and uh, blood for a couple of feet anyway. So that kind of made me react. But as interesting, if not more so, was the patient's response. He said, what are you doing? And he opened his eyes, because his eyes had been closed. And I said, what's the matter? He said, I could feel you. I could feel your hand touching my phantom. So those two things were profoundly weird in a very positive sense, because something happened. It wasn't, I suppose you could say it was, you know, there's that term for sheer delusional system of folie adieu that we had created some sort of something, but neither of us was expecting it or hoping it. And it was very, very palpable. I continued the smoothing out motion, and he described the pain flowing out a hole in the bottom of his foot. And I was very excited until he said, told me to stop. He asked me to stop, and I said, why? I thought it was helping you. And he said, well, it is making the pain go away, but that's a very uncomfortable feeling because without the pain, I won't have a leg. And he was psychologically not ready to accept fully that he was an amputee. So the pain was serving a very important existential function that overrode whatever physical discomfort he might have had. So in that, that was like a 20-minute session. And it literally took me 20 years to unpack all the things that happened. And it was so, so rich. So um, oh, just to show you that therapeutic touch is not just a placebo. Um, effect. They've done studies with cel cells in culture in vitro to, you know, fibroblasts are not known for having a strong placebo response to anything. So the fact that you can, and these are, you know, there are a lot of studies along these lines now. Uh, Bill's stuff with cancer is in the same vein that it's an animal model. So you take away a lot of the psychological variables that uh, humans bring to the table. So this is just this, the summary of that case with Jim. <laughs> and this, it's a really good, <laughs> it's a really good uh, embodiment of what could be possible. Unfortunately, I only came across this picture and this idea after I had, uh, you know, moved from the inpatient to outpatient and didn't have access to uh, phantom <laughs> patients. But I, I believe they could at least sense the, the opposite limbs. I don't know what would happen if they. It's worth, it's worth, worth following up on. So therapeutic touch is one way of, of treating it. Uh, the other way is with energy psychology. Um, are, are folks here familiar with EFT or tapping or energy psychology? Just, just get, yeah, so a, a good number. And the notion is that you can activate your acupuncture points by tapping yourself. And if you do that while you're considering unpleasant emotions and unpleasant situations in a frame of mind of self-acceptance, you have that kind of release breath. And um, it's built up a very considerable literature over the last 15 years or so, especially with post-traumatic stress disorder. So as a kind of aside, I think it's the treatment of choice now for PTSD, even though 
getting acceptance in the mainstream is, is, is taking a while. But um, you, I use this, this approach with some other uh, phantom patients. And let me show you one particular approach. This is a woman who had hurt a finger at work and it got infected, uh, cut and got infected. And the abscess didn't respond to antibiotics. So she, it was a bone infection. So she ended up having her finger amputated. However, it wasn't all ro bed of roses afterwards because she had so much problems with the insurance company and denial of claims and case management. Plus, it, w it became painful to wear her prosthetic finger because of the phantom pain. She was ashamed about what the stump looked like. She didn't socialize. So it was a whole downward spiral. We did two sessions with this. And it's really, it's a very brief 10-minute process of even though I hate the way my stump looks and even though I'm angry at the case manager, I accept myself fully and completely tap through th some things. It's very simple, um, easy to learn. So she did it twice and then, <coughs> excuse me, the next time she came back, she had a very mischievous grin and she said, Dr. Leskowitz, I have something I want to show you. <laughs> <laughs> She's able to wear her prosthetic finger. That in the course of those two, as a result of those two treatments, her pain dissipated. She was able to, um, you know, put it back in place and she was able to resume socialization and do all the, all the things that made her life important. And it was just a very simple approach because, you know, honestly, you don't expect a surgeon to ask about how emotionally upsetting it was to, you know, lose a, a limb in an accident or, um, although sometimes uh, a couple of examples I had, patients went into surgery thinking they were going to have a toe removed for, you know, diabetic gangrene and they woke up to found that their whole foot had been removed. So the whole, Helplessness around that is a common uh, feeling. So these are some of the other kinds of um, traumas reported by not just phantom limb patients. I mean, obviously these are universal types of traumas, but each phantom patient, that, phantom limb patient that I worked with, had one of these to a significant degree. And a lot of it is about anger for doctors not helping or uh, the accident itself. Often, an adult, a minor adult injury, will trigger. Uh, similar but much more intense childhood memory, and a lot of it is shame. People are just ashamed of, how, of their appearance, and it's hard to accept. So that feeling of hopelessness is the common denominator. This is a protocol for a study, and I'm not showing it. It's not a very uh, incredibly uh, elaborate or complicated one, but I'm telling you this because it got rejected twice through Harvard Medical School. Once was, um, it was just to see whether you could demonstrate positive benefits from this tapping protocol. The first time around, it was rejected because um, there were too many factors to the treatment and it would be important to dismantle them to know which elements of treatment were important. So I rewrote it as a dismantling study and next year submitted again. And that time it got rejected because we didn't know whether it was effective or not. We needed to put all the elements together and do a proof of concept uh, study. So, I realized that was a catch-22 and I wasn't going to, um, so I didn't uh, pursue that research. But what really got me interested was the idea of imaging the phantom limb because pictures worth a thousand words, one image of a phantom in space, you can't talk your way out of that one. So there were a couple of different uh, technologies um, and approaches that I want to talk about in the last few minutes here. Uh, clairvoyant perception is an important one. Uh, many of you may know Donna Eden. Her work with uh, Eden Energy Medicine has been really crucial, and she can see energy fields, much like, um, I forget who uh, I was talking with, uh, the, the Chi Institute, uh, Rosalind Briere is the medical intuitive consultant there, and she could see the energy in the absent legs, and she could see the meridian lines as strongly as if his legs were still there. So, you know, if you work with someone and trust them, that's impressive, but if you're a skeptic, it's still not there. So what are some of the, the gizmos that are available? This, is, um, this, this book was very important 25 years ago when it first came out. And the cover is a, a Curlian image. People, people know about Curlian photography, the, the, the biofield that exists around a healthy leaf. So the question was, what, what would you predict would happen if you chopped off the tip of the leaf? Would the field follow contiguously to the um, tissue of the leaf or something else? And because this is a savvy audience. I'm not gonna surprise anybody. Oh, well, that's just how, how it's set up. But um, this, is what, this is what it looks like. That 
some sort of field residue is still there even though there's no remaining tissue. Um, so it's not that the electromagnetic phenomena is generated by the water or the chlorophyll or cell membranes or something. It's somehow separate and possibly even prior to um, the cell itself. This, that was a much earlier study. This is a more recent one which um, has a phenomenal amount of detail. This is where the, the cut was made. So there's no, there's no leaf up there. It's the electromagnetic structure is just as detailed where there isn't a leaf as where there is leaf. And this is just shortly after the cut. It dissipates with time. Some, you know, the, the leaf isn't part of a living plant, which is a whole other aspect of the experiment to test. So, you know, how to understand that. I think this, this um, image is probably the best way. You think of the cells of the body. Well, you, you know, this is the iron filings in a magnetic field that the cells in the body are like the iron filings. And if you brush away, if you amputate the iron filings, the magnetic lines of force are still there. We happen not to be able to see them with our eyes, but they can still be there, and they can still um, do their function. So here's a bonus feature for t from today's lecture. You know what that's an image of? That's cell, that's cell division, mitosis. Those are the chromosomes from one cell splitting to form a second cell. And the reason I'm showing you this is, just look at the shape. Why? I mean, what, what does, why would each individual cell have its own magnetic field that seemingly is directing cell mitosis? So I'm just tossing that out there if any of your Angling for a Nobel Prize, there you go. Just, just mention me in your acceptance speech. <laughs> no, but th there's something, something significant in that image and I have not seen it addressed um, appropriately. So just a quick survey of some of the attempts we've made to image the phantom. Um, this is actually just a Xerox of my hand um, in this position because we, we tried to take a, a curling image of a patient who was missing the the distal joint of his thumb. So what you're going to see as the, as the Curlian image um, is in that same uh, alignment. Um, this is a very cool looking image, but unfortunately his, his finger, was, the missing part was out here. So this is just showing something around the living tissue. Um, the, the acupuncture and Curlian photographer person that I worked with, uh, Marnie Nazer, some of you may know her work, um, thanks. Um, thought that it just required too much um, electrical intensity and overrode whatever field there might be. So we're working on a refinement with the Institute of Frontier Science people, Beverly Rubick and her team. Um, GDV is a way of assessing activity of um, acupuncture meridians in each finger and it constructs, uh, the software constructs an image of what the biofield looks like. This is a person who's missing a leg and the field looks the same, but it's not, it's not a direct image, so it's not quite what we were hoping for. So we turned to England and PIP, poly contrast interference photography. This is an image of a holy man that supposedly shows his uh, spreading aura. And on their, their website, they had a picture of using that approach with someone with uh, an amputation. It's really hard to tell what's happening. This is the stump of the arm. You can't really tell. They had him tilt sideways. And they claim this shows the phantom limb. I wasn't convinced, so I worked with um, Center for Biofield Research um, in India and gathered a fair number of subjects and positioned them, you know, in a sensible way so that the, the, the arm or the leg is away from the body. And this is what it looks like. That there's, there's nothing out there. So they actually acknowledge that mm, their device isn't yet able to, uh, to sense, the, to detect the phantom. So, as things stand now, there is not uh, an analog to the phantom leaf effect. We don't have a clear image of a phantom human. But um, those are the directions that we're working on. And I think it's really important to understand the trauma links because energy and trauma are so closely um, connected. Um, and it, it goes back to traditional Chinese medicine that the mind directs the energy and the, and the, emotional, uh, the emotions can block the energy flow and that will impact your physiology. So the key finding is that some of these energy treatments 
dissipate the pain too quickly to be a result of neuroplasticity. And that, um, that there's something energetic that happens first and the brain follows suit. We don't have all those steps mapped out yet, but we have a ways to go. If you want to read more detail about fleshing out this model, huh, that's a good one. <laughs> fleshing out this model, I mean, you know, the, the inner mind is pretty, pretty funny at times. Um, this, is, this is available from um, Explore, the, uh, the Journal of Healing and Consciousness. And just want to say that um, doing work like we're doing here in this conference feels like that this medieval um, shepherd who's wandered a little bit far afield to the point where he's broken through you know, the barriers of reality as he knows it and is now able to watch and listen to the music of the spheres. And I think that's what these conferences do. They allow us to kind of break, break through the paradigm and, and in a shared setting, not just, not just Imagine what he's going to encounter when he goes back down to the village. But if you meet up with other shepherds who have poked through that veil, then, then some cool stuff happens. So those are the main points I want to make. Thank you for your attention. A few years ago, I had one of the big early programs to electrically stimulate paraplegics to stand and walk. And... Um, of course, they had no motor function, and they had very little or zero sensory function because the amount of electrical energy used for an able-bodied person could never stand the pain. But I required them to have proprioception, meaning, you know, proprioceps. They had to know in space where their limbs were. It was an open loop program, so that I, to be successful, they had to know where their limbs were in space. These are spinal cord injured patients? Yes, okay. spinal cord injured paraplegics. Okay. And a number of patients, I never rejected a person, they all had proprioception, even though they didn't have, I know they didn't have little sensory, right, right. because they couldn't stand the pain. Did, has anybody looked at you know, I just thought, well, there must be some separate nerve path that they didn't have, but what your oh, work I, I, suggests that there may be something else that gives them the proprioception uh, I think, clue. I think that's an energetic sensation that they're experiencing. And the example that comes to mind is there's a yoga instructor from uh, Minnesota um, who himself is paraplegic and got into yoga as part of his recovery process. He's still paralyzed, but he's developed such fine sensitivity to what goes on that he feels this sense of presence, he calls it. He feels presence in the rest of his body. So that's what he trains his patients to do, is to, to feel and be with their body so that it's not just you know, dragging along a chunk of wood kind of thing. And so it's exactly that, that proprioceptive sense. So I think that's energetic rather than neurologic. Eric, quickly, uh, it dawned on me in seeing some of your imagery of beliefs and stuff, there was a guy, George Delawar who did some pictures, I think radionic pictures, I can't quite remember how it was, but what struck me is when the pictures were best focused, it was a time thing. So if you imagine just like tuning a lens, and I forget exactly what the, the point was, but that there was a, a moment in time when it was most in focus and the other images when they weren't synchronized with time correctly were um, just more out of focus, but they were not non-existent. Yeah, well, y there are a lot of variables involved, and that's why, for example, the phantom leaf effect, it depends on the photographer. Some people had a knack for getting those images and others couldn't. Um, one theory is that there was act it's an interactive process, that it's not just a leaf there and an operator here, that if there's an energetic connection, it sort of activates the leaf to show its field more, more directly. So it might have been the same with the, the radionics uh, situation. I can't give you the author's name, but I'm sure you're familiar with the, uh, there's been several re rubber hand illusion studies. And, uh, and one in particular I read uh, was that when the person is experiencing that out of phase or discoincidence where their hand is kind of mapping onto the rubber hand, that the actual physical temperature in their um, actual hand drops by about a degree or so, uh, and, which is a, a huge amount. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. And so I think what's really interesting is that, um, you know, we, we know this subjectively or anecdotally through out-of-body experience, 
that you know there's there's ways to get out of phase or just coincidence with the physical body without you know having to necessarily have the trauma. Mm. So I think it'd be interesting even with a non uh, uh, you know uh, severed limb case where you could actually see if you can you know photograph the, uh, the the rubber hand or you know try to even have someone just try to produce a, something that's slightly out of disc coincidence. But as a as a follow up to that, I think it's kind of interesting though is that when people do experience you know, when you call it astral travel or out-of-body experience, whatever. Um, there, you know, there's veridical elements. So you can could be somewhere and right, witness right, events right, and things. Right. But we still bring our clothes with us, right? You subjectively see yourself with clothes. If you go and you meet outside of the body, your colleagues or whatever, they're going to be wearing clothes. So, yeah. so what is that? It's like there's something that it. Part of it points to this idea of a of a an actual mediating body that's generating this energetic field that you're seeing as the aura. So it's like maybe like a para body or a psychosome or what have you. Right. But then part of it seems like we bring our conditioned elements with it. So there's like this, you know, what's really generating, what's the over body that's generating this construction of the, you know, of the physical. Yeah, no, the, again, these phenomena are generated at so many different levels. It's, they're all, they all play a role. For example, with, with phantom limb, sometimes if the pain isn't there and there's the presence, over time it, it retracts and absorb, resorbs into the body and there's no longer that sense there. And I'm sure that that reflects some measurable change in the external. And you should talk to people like Jim Tucker looking at the, you know, kids that have the uh, experience, memories from past lives. Past and they lives. have the scars and everything right, from the, right, you right. know, from the energetic body damage. So. Right, right. So which, which level of that multidimensional energy body do these things originate from? Right. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's very cool. Thank you. Thanks. Let's thank our speaker again.